books on the market. They're in the news. Um, so I was just saying we were coming up with a plan for the speaker series for this semester. And we said, Friedman really needs to have a conversation about these new weight loss drugs that are on the market. They're in the news on almost a daily basis. You see headlines about Wagovi and Ozempic. Um, and, you know, somebody even facetiously asked me, like, is this going to put Friedman out of business? Um, and, and so I think it would be really important for us to have a conversation to understand, you know, what is going on in this domain. It's something that many of us don't interact with um, in our research. And so we were asking around to say, well, how could we bring in a speaker on this topic? So we were very grateful that actually our own Dari Mazfarian said that he would do it and um, share with us a perspective that he put out recently. So Dari, of course, needs no introduction here at Friedman, but for students who might have come in more recently, you, I think, hopefully are aware that he was our former dean and is now head of the Food is Medicine Institute here at Tufts. And so, Dari, we're so delighted to have you. Um, thanks again for joining virtually because I understand that, that uh, some things have come up, and so we're very grateful to have you with us virtually and looking forward to an engaging discussion on this topic. So without further ado, why don't you kick it off and we'll have a discussion at the end. Uh, wonderful. Thank you uh, for the introduction. And sorry, I couldn't be there in person, but pleased to uh, you know, speak speak virtually. So hopefully you can hear me okay. Yeah, great. Okay, I'll share my screen. And we'll sort of kick off the discussion, you know, what is going on with, with GLP-1s. Um, hopefully you see my screen now. And so what I want to talk about is, um, you know, thinking about GLP ones in in the context of uh, lifestyle, nutrition disparities, um, really going through, I think um, what we know and 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 what are some of the promise and also some of the concerns about GLP ones. And so hopefully there'll be plenty of time for for discussion as well. So and, and as mentioned, um, I published uh, just a couple page viewpoint on this topic. Uh, a couple of weeks ago in in JAMA, and so anyone who's interested can look at look it up online. It's freely available. Um, uh, it published on February 29th. So it's it's worth just starting out with with you know we really have to just remind ourselves why we're even talking about GLP ones, and it is this just incredible rise in obesity uh, in the United States, but really around the world, and what's still just continues to shock me is how recent this is. This really started around 1985 or 1990. And so, you know, in my adult lifetime, we have seen this obesity epidemic happen. This, this ob obesity rates were pretty stable in the United States from 1940 to, to 1980 or, or so. For 40 years, they were pretty stable and, and, and before that. So really something pretty dramatic change. And I think if you look at all the things that change, really food is by far the thing that changed the most um, uh, after, after 1990. And what these maps show is the rates of obesity uh, in the United States in three time points, just 15 years apart, right? This is just 15 years in the United States, which is just a blink of an eye when looking at a whole population. But look what happened if you look at the rates uh, of obesity in the United States. They went from you know, 10 to 14% at the highest, and many states less than 10%. And within just 15 years, you have states that have over 30% rates, you know, no state less than 15% and, and most states 20 to 30%. And of course, that's just 2005. And I, and I will point out that this is BRFSS. Um, so this isn't measured heights and weights. Um, and so actually, this is, all of this is a little bit of an underestimate. The obesity rates are actually higher, higher than this. But so this is 15 years. And, and let's go forward another 15 years to today. And again, where we go back in 2005, you know, the highest states were at 30%, over 30% obesity. Most states were 20 to 30%. Now, you don't have pretty any states uh, below 25%, um, uh, and very few states below 30%. And so, even 15 years ago, 30% was the highest. Now, 30% is the lowest. And and so now we have most states in the United States obesity rates between 30 to 40% and some states 40 to 45% and some now over 50% or, or, or getting close to 50%. So really just shocking, shocking changes in obesity in just 30 years. And if you look at it, you know, just another way in just the last 10 years, again, it's just incredible. This is, uh, you know, states with, with overall obesity and then 
uh, severe obesity uh, rates over over 35 percent. And you can see that that this is just the number of, of states, the number of states. We've gone from 12 states with obesity rates of 30 to 35 percent to 41 states, 41 states with obesity rates of of of, of uh, 30 to 35 percent, and 19 of the states, half of them, obesity rates over 35 percent. Just an incredible change in 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 what's happening. And there's so many negative downstream consequences of obesity, uh, type two diabetes being most notable, but also heart attacks strokes, many cancers, gallstones, polycystic kidney disease, depression, back pain, you know, the list goes, goes on and on. Uh, and this is not equally distributed amongst, uh, in our society due to uh, structural oppression uh, that's related to, to geography, education, income, and race, ethnicity. And if you look at here, just non-Hispanic white, non-Hispanic black and Hispanic rates in, in 2022, the same maps, but again, divided by race, you can see that rates of obesity are far higher among non-Hispanic Black uh, and also Hispanic adults compared to non-Hispanic White. There's also a gender difference with women having higher rates than men, particularly non-Hispanic Black women have the highest um, uh, rates in, in the United States among you know, sex and uh, uh, race, race, ethnicity subgroups. So there's also just just really dire disparities, uh, and and this is not just a cosmetic issue. You know, again, with all of the incredible health complications that that are happening from this, longevity is also going down in the United States for the first time in our history over the last five years. And while a lot has been made of the the really terrible uh, uh, opioid epidemic uh, that that has happened and has contributed to that. The, the majority of the decline in longevity is from diet-related chronic disease, uh, from disease uh, happening at younger and younger ages. Another really worrisome trend is that while death from heart attacks has been dropping in the United States for about 30 years, uh, it's rising now among uh, middle-aged, younger and middle-aged adults because they're growing up with uh, obesity and diabetes and other metabolic diseases. Heart disease rates are, are going back up in the United States for the, for the first time ever. So, you know, with this, um, the, there's an incredible attention on these new drugs, these GLP-1 agonists, uh, glucagon-like peptide agonists. Agonists means that these uh, drugs bind the same receptors in a positive way. They activate uh, GLP-1 receptors throughout the body. So you can think of these as kind of mimicking the natural GLP-1 hormone. And what's, what's to me, really fascinating about these drugs is they were pretty much developed as diabetes drugs. And so this is a chart of some of the drugs that have been approved um, for various indications. And you can go, you know, go back to 2005 to the first one approved. They were largely studied for type 2 diabetes. These drugs were not developed as weight loss drugs. All, all of the biology and all of the um, uh, research that had gone on to, to develop these drugs over, you know, really 20, 30 years before this was focused on diabetes. So this is also, I think, quite telling that the most effective weight loss medication that's ever been developed uh, by humanity was developed on accident. And, and honestly, we still don't fully know exactly how and why these drugs work. We obviously have some, some sense of what happens and we know how, how patients feel. But, but the actual specific mechanisms are still be, being determined. And so that, that alone tells us how little we understand about obesity, that this drug was developed for type 2 diabetes. So what, do, uh, what does GLP-1 naturally do in the body? Another fascinating thing for, for folks who are interested in food and nutrition is where does GLP-1 come from? It comes from the intestines in response to, to food. So this is fundamentally a hormone that, that is really closely, closely related to what we eat and, and to the, the cells of the intestine. Uh, and so the GLP-1 from the intestine is synthesized and goes throughout the body. Uh, in the uh, liver, um, it, it reduces glucose production, uh, which is very important. In the pancreas, it increases insulin synthesis and in insulin uh, secretion, and it also slows gastric emptying, meaning that, that, you know, nutrients release into the small intestine slows. And so that kind of slows the, the rush of nutrients into the blood. And so these effects is why GLP-1s were, were developed as a diabetes drug 
to lower blood glucose because they said, look, liver glucose production goes down, insulin goes up in the pancreas and gastric emptying slows. All of that should help a diabetic uh, improve their, their uh, blood sugar control. But what has since been realized, they noticed that patients who were on these, uh, diabetic patients who were uh, on these studies uh, and had their blood sugar improve also were losing weight. And this was totally unexpected. And, and so more research has been done and GLP-1 receptors have, have now been identified throughout the body. And one of the more important areas of GLP-1 activity for weight loss is in the brain. Uh, and so there are GLP-1 receptors in the brain and people who uh, take GLP-1s describe, you know, sort of just the loss of, of, of craving for food. Um, Jose Andres was, was uh, talking about this. He tried GLP-1s for a couple of months, Chef Jose Andres, and he said, you know, I had these voices in my head. I had these voices in my head telling me, eat, 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 and eat, and I eat healthy food all the time, but then I see this junk food and this snack. And, my, and he said, when I was on the, on the drug, the voices went away. Uh, and so, and so there's something about, you know, cravings and, and drive for, for food in the brain that GLP ones activate. GLP ones also activate, not shown here, also seem to activate uh, brown fat. Brown fat is specialized fat tissue that's different than the usual white fat that burns energy. And so brown fat was originally really um, studied because it's present in hibernating animals like bears, for example, they, they use the brown fat to keep themselves warm while they're sleeping. And so they, they burn the brown fat to keep their bodies warm. Um, humans also have brown fat and that brown fat burns heat. And so instead of uh, calories going to your fat cells for storage as energy, calories go to your fat cells and are burned off uh, as temperature, which is a great way to lose to lose um, uh, extra calories and, and to help with control body weight. And so glp ones also see, uh, appear to activate brown fat. So there's a, a whole range of GLP-1 uh, activities, but they're really, the, I think the take home messages are this is coming from the intestine, stimulated by what we eat uh, and, and has you know, effects throughout, throughout the body. And so you know, these drug companies, Nova Nordisk and Eli Lilly in particular, they said, wow, you know, we developed this as a diabetes drug and it's been a, been a, a booming success as, as a diabetes drug, but what if we study this for obesity? And so to do that, you have to go to FDA and, and perform sort of landmark trials. And so this is the landmark trial published uh, in 2021, comparing a, sem a semaglutide, which is Ozempic and Wagovi. You'll hear the term Ozempic, but Ozempic is actually a semaglutide uh, marketed for diabetes. Wagovi is the exact same drug marketed for obesity. It has different brand names, but most people say Ozempic, but technically it should be Wagovi, but the, the generic name is semaglutide. So this is the landmark trial. And what they found is that there's about 15% weight loss uh, in the semaglutide group over about a year uh, compared to about two or 3% uh, in the placebo group. And Several other agents have been tried. There's now combination agents that bind not only the GLP-1 receptor, but other receptors uh, as well, related receptors as well. And generally, this is pretty consistent. There's about a 15% weight loss compared to placebo um, uh, in these, you know, sort of landmark landmark trials. Now, 15% weight loss is a big deal. If you weigh 300 pounds and you get down to, you know, lose 45 pounds and get down to two, 250 or so, that's really, really important for health. Now, of course, that, that also means that these drugs are not going to eliminate obesity because the maximum weight loss is, is 15%. And so again, if you have a 300 pound uh, adult and they lose 45 pounds, they're still obese, um, but they're much healthier, but they're still obese. So, so at, these drugs are not going to eliminate obesity, but they can make a big, a, a, a big improvement. And, and by the way, if 300 pounds sounds heavy to you, uh, one in 11 adults in the United States weighs over 300 pounds. So that's a pretty common, uh, pretty common weight in the United States to weigh over 300 pounds. Almost one in 10 adults uh, weighs over 300 pounds right now. So the, the public response has been unbelievable, just a, a, a feeding frenzy, pardon the pun, um, you know, really just, just uh, uh, you know, uh, uh, D dominating, you know, uh, uh, the public. And the only thing that's keeping the drug from being used more is the companies just can't make the drug fast enough. They're making the drug as fast as they possibly can 
to meet clinical and public demand and there's shortages and and all kinds of problems. Uh, and part of those problems are because you know of, of doctors you know prescribing for patients, but also uh, wealthy individuals just paying for the drug themselves even when they don't meet meet indications is a pretty big market as well. Now these two drug companies, Novo Nordisk uh, and Eli Lilly, are two of the biggest drug companies in the world. They've been around a long time. I think Novo Nordisk has been around more than 100 years, if I, if I recall correctly. In just the two years since these drugs were, were came out and were studied and approved for obesity, their stock prices tripled, tripled. So you can just you, you investors see the writing on the wall. Investors see what's going to happen. Uh, how much money these drugs are going to make, uh, how much money it's going to cost to pay for these drugs. These two companies today, their combined valuation is more than a trillion dollars. There's not very many companies in the world, as you know, probably just two or three that are worth more than a trillion. These two companies together are now worth more than a trillion. And this statistic that I, that I think is also telling, Novo Nordisk, which is based in Denmark, its valuation is now greater than the entire annual GDP of its of its home country. So so these these are blockbuster drugs and we're just starting to scratch the surface of how much they're going to cost because again the companies are building factories like crazy to really to really pump these drugs out. And, and you know I mentioned celebrities these are three celebrities who publicly publicly talked about using um, uh, Ozempic. I mentioned uh, Jose Andres at a meeting I was recently at with him spoke about it, that he tried it for a, a couple of months. Uh, so, so people are talking about this and it's in the news uh, and, and you know, it's definitely on people's minds. So let's talk about cost. So, so the cost is what is absolutely crushing for these drugs. If these drugs cost, you know, $100 a month, $50 a month, there wouldn't be, they wouldn't, they would be fine to use and, and, and not really cause any economic problems. But their list price, is about twelve thousand to sixteen thousand dollars per year per person. Now, um, uh, health payers negotiate, and and this is all in the United States. Health, health payers negotiate, and so they can negotiate what are called discounted prices. Those discounted prices are not made public because every payer negotiates by themselves. But from my uh, conversations with people, the lowest discounted cost I've heard of is around 7,000 per year. So about half price. So that, that's kind of the, the lowest price we're, we're seeing right now. Now people say, oh, well, the price is gonna go down. They're gonna come off patent. They're gonna become generic. Don't hold your breath. That is not gonna happen anytime soon. Uh, these drugs are protected by an average of 20 different patents. And many of these patents extend to 2040 and beyond. And so we're not gonna see lower prices you know, anytime in the next decade. And even if when the drugs go off patent, We've seen from other classes of drugs, blood pressure lowering drugs, cholesterol lowering drugs, uh, diabetes drugs, um, that that when a generic drug, uh, when a drug on patent becomes generic, the drug company knows that's going to happen. And so they do so many things to develop new drugs and combination drugs and other things and market them to keep their share uh, and to keep their 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 profits high so that the generic drug doesn't get used. And so have no doubt that in 10 years or 15 years or when, when some of these drugs become generic, there's going to be other more advanced drugs that are, you know, equally expensive uh, that give really incremental benefits, just maybe just slightly greater weight loss than the current drugs, but those are going to be heavily marketed and heavily used. And so we're, we're not going to see any decline in price in these drugs for, for at least, you know, 10 to 15 years. Now, what does that mean in practice? There's a lot of expensive drugs, but there's never been, never never been such an expensive drug for which millions and millions of people qualify. That's what's really unique about these drugs. There's lots of expensive drugs. There's some drugs that cost a million dollars for a single use. For example, if they cure a sickle cell disease or if they cure um, you know, hepatitis C, but there are not that many people with those conditions. Here, 93 million Americans meet eligibility criteria to use these drugs for weight loss. That's that's not even counting people who meet eligibility criteria for diabetes. This is just for weight loss. And the criteria are uh, that's been approved by FDA are uh, having obesity or BMI greater than 30 or being overweight with some other metabolic condition like high blood glucose, high cholesterol, or high diabetes, uh, high uh, uh, um, uh, 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 glucose, blood pressure, or cholesterol. Uh, and so 93 million Americans meet criteria at the list price 
if all eligible Americans were on the drug, it would cost us $1.3 trillion per year uh, at the heavily discounted price, the, the, the maximum discounted price now, this will cost $600 billion per year. To put that in perspective, the total current U.S. spending on all pharmaceutical drugs right now is $600 billion. So we're talking about doubling our entire spend on, 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 on pharmacy uh, in just the next few years. This is going to happen. This is just unbelievably frightening to payers federal payers, commercial payers, and it should be unbelievably frightening to anybody who cares about anything else we spend money on in the economy, education, infrastructure, uh, uh, rehab, mental health. You know, there's there so many things we want to spend money on in our society, uh, food, and 600 doubling our pharmacy spend is, is going to really put the, our, our, our country in, in bankruptcy. Now, the other really important point is, you know, you could say, well, they're expensive, but they reduce obesity and obesity, you know, costs a lot of money. There's, it, there's very high health care costs from obesity. So, so isn't that going to save money in the long run? And I've talked to so many politicians and even doctors who say this, who say, oh, yeah, of course they're expensive, but, but they're reducing obesity. But this has been looked at very, very carefully, um, even accounting for the long term health benefits from reduced health care spending from, from lower uh, obesity even accounting for that, and even at the maximum discounted prices that are that, that, that are available, these are drugs are not cost effective. And cost effectiveness, they're certainly not cost savings. They do not save money, absolutely in no circumstance save money. You have to pay for health. But even the price we pay for health, which is what cost effectiveness is, the price we pay for health is not a good buy. And so the, the, the cost effectiveness is, is measured in something uh, uh, called the incremental cost effectiveness ratio, which means how much do we spend for quality adjusted life year gained? And you, you wanna be at less than $50,000 for quality adjusted life year gained, that's ideal, or at worst, less than about $150,000 for quality adjusted life year gained. And the cost effectiveness ratios for these drugs, even at discounted prices, are between 240 and $480,000 per quality adjusted life year gained. Uh, and so these are not good buys uh, uh, and certainly do not save money. Now, beyond all of the price issues, um, people don't actually stay on the drug. And this is something that has really not been widely talked about, but is starting to be talked about. In the randomized trials, the drug companies were really careful about which kinds of patients they selected, who the doctors were, and of course, they wanted to see the best possible effect. So they did everything possible to ensure that the patients stayed on the drugs. That's what they should do. That's not nefarious. That's not bad. The drug companies should be trying to maximize compliance with the drug. But in the real world, right, when there's, there's not all of that attention on, on people taking the drug. There's not all of that care. There's lots of side effects. There's lots of the most obvious side effects are gastrointestinal. There's lots of nausea uh, and, and other, other gastrointestinal side effects, very common. But interestingly, I've, I've been hearing more and more about personality changes that, that people, that the same way um, that sort of craving for food is decreased, you know, craving for other things is decreased. Sexual drive is decreased, um, you know, craving to go out and do fun things has been decreased. I, I spoke with somebody who who had a very good friend who they said was one of the most gregarious, funny friends they had. And they've gone on a GLP-1 and lost weight, but they're just, they're just not that, that they don't seem that happy anymore. They're not gregarious and funny and, and making jokes the way they did. They don't have that zest for life. So there's, there's clearly side effects to these drugs. And, and so what happens in the real world, um, Prime Therapeutics, which is one of the biggest pharmacy benefit managers in the country, published these results. At one year, only one in four patients are still taking the drug. So 75% of patients stop taking the drug at one year. Why is that important? It's important because when people go off the drug, they regain the weight. And so now think about what you've done. You've spent 10 or $15,000 to lose some weight uh, and then 75% of people go off the drug and then within six to 12 months, they regain the weight. And so, so not only did you spend the $15,000, which is highly cost ineffective, but then all of the weight was regained. And so even those cost effectiveness analyses that I, that I showed you are, go out the window because there, there is no long-term health benefit. And this is one uh, study that looked you know, at weight regain when people stopped the drug. 
This was you know, long-term observation from the randomized trial that I showed you. There's been other studies looking at this as well. And as you can see at the red line, uh, when, when the treatment stops compared to placebo, the weight is rapidly regained on average to where there's a pretty small difference at follow-up. And other studies have shown no difference by, by after about a year. Uh, you know, depending on, on the study. So this is a, a big, big problem when 75% of patients are going off the drug uh, that, that the weight does not stay on. The other thing to point out is that the weight, if people do stay on the drug, the weight loss plateaus. And so it doesn't just keep going down, it plateaus at about 15%. And so you get all your bang for your buck in the first year for about $15,000 of spending. And then you have to spend that $15,000 every year for the rest of the person's life just to keep their weight stable, no more weight loss, just to kind of maintain that, that weight gain. That seems incredibly inefficient and problematic. Now, the, the final issue I wanna raise as a challenge to these drugs um, is that even everything I showed you, the, the real world weight loss is also less. And so this was just recently published from, from uh, Epic Research. This is looking at the real world weight loss um, you know, and not even compared to placebo. So if you compared it to placebo, it would be less. This is just the real world weight loss. I mentioned it's about 15% weight loss uh, in, the, uh, in, in the original randomized trials. Here, if you look at patients with diabetes, it's about 8% weight loss. And if you look at patients without diabetes, it's about 11% weight loss. So even the weight loss is less when people do stay on the drug. Uh, and this is that the highest dose of 2.4 milligrams if you look at lower doses, uh, and there are patients on these lower doses because they can't tolerate the higher doses because of side effects, there's actually, they found no significant weight loss um, uh, 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 on average, or very little significant weight loss on average with some, some variation. Now, <clears throat> um, so, we, so there's, there's real problems here for, for payers. And so payers are, 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 are appropriately frightened. And so what do they do here? So Medicare, which is, of course, the biggest insurance program uh, in the country covering all adults over age 65, does not cover GLP-1s. Uh, even though it's been approved by FDA, Medicare is still not paying for it uh, because it would bankrupt Medicare. Medicaid has limited coverage, but it's quite limited, challenging, long approval process is difficult to get, um, but, but Medicaid is covering it in limited ways, and it's really raising uh, state uh, um, um, payments for healthcare because states you know, share in the cost of Medicaid and that's a challenge. Commercial plans started out, many of them said, okay, we'll, we'll cover it. But now that they've seen these data, they're starting to either take away coverage, reduce coverage, or, or in some cases, more recently, put lifetime caps. So they say, okay, we'll cover it, but we'll only cover it for $20,000 total over your lifetime, which is about you know, a year and a half of treatment. I actually don't know why they would do that because you know you get the year and a half of treatment and then the pe person goes off the drug uh, and then they gain their weight back. So you know that's twenty thousand uh, dollars down down the drain. But that's currently what they're doing. Uh, and so and so really rationing has been the approach. Now in this space, <clears throat> startups are are coming in and they're going to these commercial plans and they're saying, look, you have a thousand patients who are, are covered in your in your company who qualify for these drugs, and they're gonna to come to you and want these drugs, send them to us. And what we'll do is we'll try to put as few of them as possible on the drug. We'll use older weight loss drugs, which have smaller effects. We'll use behavioral counseling. We'll teach them about nutrition. We'll teach them about physical activity. And we'll keep most of them off the drug and, and um, you know, save you money. And so commercial plans are, 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 are biting. They, they, they love this because they say, look, if, if we have a thousand patients and they all go on the drug, we're gonna lose a lot of money. If at least only 20% of them or so go on the drug and the other 80% don't and they're satisfied, even if they don't lose all of that weight and they're satisfied, we, we net lose less money. You're still spending money, but we lose less money. And so the startups get some of that, some of that difference. But this is not you know, really the best approach. You know, I've said a lot of negative things about the GLP-1s, but these are still by far, by far the most effective drugs for weight loss we've, we've ever discovered. And so keeping them from people who qualify for them, you know, and sort of trying to give them less effective treatments to save money, that's not the ideal approach, right? Ideally, you'd want everyone who qualifies to get the drug. So that's, that's not a, a, a great approach. And that approach still doesn't, doesn't deal with 
the challenge of long-term adherence, long-term tolerance, and other challenges, even for people that, that, that get the drug. And then finally, and really importantly to me, behavior change is hard. And so behavioral counseling that just uses dietary advice, that just uses you know, counseling, is not going to work that well for most people and especially is not going to work well for people who are facing structural barriers to a healthy diet and healthy lifestyle. And so this has been studied that counseling can actually increase disparities. If you really focus on education and counseling, you can increase disparities because people know what to do, but they can't do it because of, of lack of income, you know, lack of an appropriate environment or, or other challenges. And so this kind of rationing approach, I'm very concerned is going to first withhold the benefit of GLP-1s from millions of people who could benefit from them, which, which is a problem. And, and secondly, increased disparities uh, among people um, who, who have you know, structural barriers so that counseling doesn't, doesn't work well for them. And as just one you know, obvious example, there's many, is looking at food insecurity. This is a map by, uh, by, by county of food insecurity in the United States. And you can see that there are many, many counties where over 25% of, of uh, households have reported about food insecurity at some point in the last year. And so just expecting people with counseling alone to be able to uh, eat a healthy diet uh, is, is, is a challenge. So this is where I think food as medicine can become a very interesting possible solution. You have this very effective, but very expensive drug that people can't stay on long-term. It does a great job in the first year to, 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 to take weight off, but then the weight plateaus. So what if you start uh, combining food as medicine with GLP-1s? And so food as medicine is really using food as a prescribed treatment, using medically tailored food, whether it's prepared meals, or groceries, or just fruits and vegetables, uh, as as a treatment for for disease. Well, we are we at the at the Friedman School uh, and across the university are doing lots and lots of great trials and and other evaluations of food as medicine. And while we still need to do a lot more research, it's pretty clear that these programs help. Uh, they help reduce uh, uh, hemoglobin A1C in patients with diabetes, which is a measure of blood uh, glucose control. They help improve blood pressure. And in several studies, um, they've actually reduced body weight a little bit. So what's quite interesting is what if these, these treatments could be used to help patients on GLP-1s with long-term weight maintenance? And so how do these programs work? Patients are, are identified by a physician. Usually there's some other social needs assessment. They have you know, disability, limited physical function. They have food insecurity. They have housing uh, 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 instability. And so a combination of a disease and a, and a social needs assessment means they're eligible. They can get medically tailored meals, usually about 10 meals per week. They can get medically tailored groceries uh, or produce prescription. And that's combined, importantly, with nutrition and culinary education uh, for, to help people who need it you know, understand how to, to cook and prepare and store uh, uh, he healthy, healthy food. And the cost of these programs varies, but produce prescription programs can be as little as you know, $40 a month. Um, medically tailored grocery programs you typically are about $100 or $150 a month. And medically tailored meals are typically around $500 uh, you know, per, per month. And so these, these programs vary, vary in price. And that's, that's you know, for the whole entire program. And as I mentioned, you know, these programs have been shown to improve food-related risks like food security, nutrition security, and diet quality. They've improved risk markers like glucose and blood pressure and body weight. They've improved how people feel, the, their ability to manage their disease, their self-perceived physical and mental health. And they've been associated with lower healthcare utilization or at least high cost effectiveness. So either cost savings or cost effectiveness. Uh, and I think these food as medicine is really uh, exciting because it can not only help food security, it can advance nutrition security. So not just getting enough calories to people, but getting enough nourishing food to people. I think this is where food as medicine is exciting, this ability to address food and nutrition security. And so it is a in healthcare innovation, which in contrast to many, many healthcare in innovations can actually move us from health disparities to health equity because food is so central to, to, to health and well-being, and food as medicine interventions directly uh, uh, aim at prioritizing um, treatment for, for vulnerable populations. And so you can move from food sufficiency to food security, to nutrition security. 
And so here's, you know, kind of the the final, you know, pr pr proposal. I think it would be really interesting, and I'm encouraging companies and researchers around the country to test this. I hope as many people test this as possible in as many different ways as possible. What happens if we could bring together GLP-1s and food as medicine in a combined staged approach to obesity treatment? So instead of rationing GLP-1s and letting few people on them or or letting everyone on them and going bankrupt, and, and then many people go off them and then they regain their weight, what if from the beginning we started people on a food as medicine program where they got very good lifestyle counseling, which was efficient and scalable using telehealth and uh, d digital uh, counseling and SMS and other things. And they got food, they got meals or groceries or produce, depending on what they needed um, from the beginning with nutrition and culinary education and, and behavior support. And they got on their GLP-1 drugs, planning to keep them on it for 12 to 18 months. Um, and then stop with a clear plan that after 12 to 18 months, they've, re they've gotten their maximum weight loss they're going to get. You stop the GLP-1 and you continue the intensive lifestyle counseling, including the food as medicine. I'm pretty, pretty confident that there's some patients who on this program would be able to maintain their, their weight loss off the GLP-1 with a good lifestyle counseling and food as medicine program. Um, we're not trying to get them to lose more weight. We're just trying to get them to maintain that initial weight loss. And so this graphic depicts this hypothetical patient. They get on the GLP-1 for 12 to 18 months. They lose weight. They're also on the food as medicine program. They go off the GLP-1 and they'll keep their weight pretty sustained over five to six years. Now, I think other patients will, will, will regain and they will, they will regain weight and, and need to go have a, have a booster period. And so every you know, three, four years, maybe they'll need another six to 12 months of GLP-1s, but that's still quite a bit better than needing continuous GLP-1s and also lowers the side effects and lowers, lowers the, the challenges with that. And then lastly, there may be some patients who'd go off the GLP-1 and immediately start to regain weight and, and just cannot handle you know, being off the GLP-1. Those patients may need to, to be on GLP-1s for life and, and, that's, and that's going to happen. You know, there's gonna be some combination. But the fact that we could successfully keep some patients off GLP-1s for life and, and after being the initial weight loss and some patients only needing occasional booster periods is gonna save billions and billions and billions of dollars, more than paying for the food as medicine, more than paying for the lifestyle counseling. As just an example, if we were able, if we took a thousand patients and who are on GLP-1s and we could keep 500 of them off GLP-1s, just half of them off GLP-1s for just one year with the food as medicine program, that saves $4 million. So, so the, the, the numbers are so astronomical. I really just want to emphasize this. Again, a thousand patients treated with GLP-1s, we, we keep half of them off the drug with food as medicine that saves $4 million. So this is, this is a no brainer to, to test this in, 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 uh, in studies. We don't even need to do it as a randomized controlled trial because we know what happens when people go off GLP-1s, they regain weight that's been seen very clearly in multiple studies. All we need to do is go to, to any health plan that has patients on GLP-1s who are interested in coming off and putting them on a food as medicine program before they come off, keep them on it for a year, and see what proportion can maintain their weight. If a, if a meaningful proportion of patients can maintain their weight after one year, that's that's massive, massive healthcare savings for 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 uh, the payer, and of course, wonderful for for um, the, the patient. What's really important to me about this approach is this could be a combination approach that actually, for the first time, starts to effectively treat obesity in our nation and starts to effectively deal with disparities in obesity treatment in our nation. For the first time, we may be able to have most people lose about 15% of their weight and then have most people keep that off with, with healthy lifestyle uh, and, and do so in a way that, that relative to the current GLP-1 use actually uh, saves money. So that's the hypothesis. There are not empiric data to, to prove that this works. Uh, this is a concept that I think needs to be tested. I'm having conversations with health payers and commercial plans and startups, encouraging them to, to do this. Uh, and I think hopefully, you know, sometime this year, maybe we'll be able to, to put, put a study together uh, and, and get started on, on this concept. So uh, I want to uh, 
you know, uh, uh, end with just going back to, to a little bit of mechanism where, where we started, you know, beyond the drugs, which are, are here and they're here to stay. So we need to understand them. It's also, let's go back to the point that GLP-1s are naturally released in the gut in response to food. And there's been very little study of what actually influences GLP-1s. And so if I were a young scientist interested in animal experiments or human trials, this would be a great thing to study. What things increase and decrease GLP-1 uh, release by the intestine? How can we naturally augment GLP-1s? There's pretty good early science that monounsaturated fats and foods rich in monounsaturated fats raise GLP-1 uh, secretion. So avocados, nuts, flaxseed, olive oil. There's also good evidence that fermentable fibers, prebiotic fibers uh, that, that the microbiome digests also uh, increase GLP-1 uh, release. And that includes things like beta-glucan and oats and rye, oligosaccharides and, and beans and peas and lentils and pectin, or which is in certain fruits. And then some evidence that protein, uh, in, in particular, when it's uh, uh, low saturated fat protein, like eggs or poultry, increase GLP-1s. Now, there are some things that also that, that decrease or blunt GLP-1s. Uh, not many studies, but some interesting studies that artificial sweeteners actually reduce GLP-1 secretion, which is quite um, fascinating given the increasing evidence about artificial sweeteners not being uh, inert and potentially being harmful. And then added sugars and saturated fat don't decrease GLP-1, but they blunt the increase. And so if you have saturated fat or added sugars with, with other things that increase GLP-1s, you actually blunt the increase. And so they don't, they don't drop GLP-1s, but they blunt it. So there's a whole world to be studied around GLP-1s and how to naturally uh, increase their intake. Uh, and so um, thank you for your attention and happy to uh, have a discussion and, and, and talk about some of these issues. I think, shall I, uh, I see there's a question online and I don't know if there will be some in the room, maybe Great, thank you. Um, I don't know if you could, you, I know you can't hear our clapping, but we did clap for you in the room. Okay. <laughs> um, thank you. I think there are a lot of questions and hands. So why don't we alternate online in the room? So Will, do you want to start and then we'll go to you, Alexandra, and then Larissa, why don't you put your hand up because I couldn't read what you put in the chat, if that's okay. Uh, and so Will, you want to kick us off? Yeah, super interesting. Thank you. And I really appreciate, really endorse the, the JAMA uh, commentary itself, which is very, very interesting and really well written, really clear. Um, just wanted to raise like three quick things. First, what you described generally sounds a lot like the current Weight Watchers organization, formerly known as Weight Watchers. Uh, you know, their current business model seems to be pretty much what you're describing a little bit. Um, mm. The second thing is I wanted to ask, what do you think of that Atlantic article about GLP-1 pathways in the brain specifically uh, that they gastrointestinal GLP-1s are too quickly cycling to be what's really going on and that perhaps there's a other GLP-1 uh, pathways that are just, you know, secreted elsewhere and happening elsewhere. And then the third question is in terms of kind of the politics around drug pricing, whether the experience of antiretrovirals is a good example. So, you know, antiretrovirals initially rolled out at similarly, you know, eye-wateringly high price points and then both the continued development of you know, lower manufacturing cost approaches, uh, greater efficacy and so forth, but then also just the political mobilization around saying access to these drugs is a human right. This is not a profit point. You do not need to have these astronomically high rates of return, right? The manufacturing cost is a tiny fraction. It's just a political debate about how, you know, what is the deservingness of the company um, and currently, I think it's recognized that, you know, Novo Nordisk and Eli Lilly like, deserve a lot for this, but they deserve this much. So those are three separate things. Um, yeah. yeah, so I'm not, I haven't kept abreast of, of the changes to, to Weight Watchers in detail, but I do know that they have updated and modernized their approach. And so, for example, they, they you know, 15 years ago, they were heavy, heavily calorie focused. It was all about calorie counting. And they, they changed that in the last 10 years with recognition that certain foods, the more you eat, you actually have less chance of weight gain. And, and so you know, we shouldn't be counting calories. We should be looking at food quality. And so they had Weight Watchers points and they basically mm -hmm. gave lots of foods, zero points. So basically you could just eat them all, all you wanted, foods like nuts and seeds and fruits and, and vegetables. And so I know they modernized that now. 
I know that Weight Watchers, who I think has actually officially changed their name to WW, I don't think they're even called Weight Watchers anymore. Huh. Um, I, I, I know that they are continuing to modernize and many companies are modernizing. I don't think of them as a right now as a food as medicine, you know, a company, but I'm sure they are think, thinking of how they can become a food as medicine company. So, so I don't know enough about it to, to comment on it. Um, I think um, there, your second question is about GLP-1 from the intestine. So the, the, the GLP-1 agonists, why, why they, they work and why they're hard to make orally is they keep the, they activate the GLP-1 receptors more chronically. And so certainly their effects are happening in the brain. Um, it's very possible that, that natural GLP-1s are being released elsewhere, but that doesn't explain the, the, that, that doesn't, wh where the natural GLP-1s are released doesn't have very much to do with the effect of the GLP-1 agonists themselves, right? The, the drug that's being injected and, and circulating, that's certainly working in the brain. So we'll, we'll go via Zempic, um, Monjuro, they're certainly working in the brain is probably one of their major effects. Uh, and then um, wh what was your last question, Will? About the drug costs and the um, ARVs. Oh yeah, antiretrovirals. I I don't I don't see that happening. Uh, you know, for a few reasons. I mean, one is that a lot of what you're talking about what was really based on, you know, getting drugs to Africa, uh, uh, AIDS drugs to Africa in particular, right? And and the human suffering and and people dying. You know, people while obesity is killing more people than AIDS. It's not that same visceral mm -hmm. you know, reaction mm -hmm. that 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 you know uh, 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 that people got around around AIDS, and and so certainly other countries are going to negotiate much lower prices in the United States. That's going to happen for sure. Um, but I don't see that that sort of moral argument about you know pe people in poor countries mm -hmm. dying of a completely you know um, treatable condition like AIDS um, and you know orphans and and all that happening for, 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 for these drugs. They're protected by patents. Patent laws are, you know, widely respected by politicians. And um, as I said, eventually some of these drugs are going to go generic, but there's going to be newer and newer ones that give you just a little bit more bang for your buck, but cost a lot more. So I'm not optimistic, Will. I, I, I think the pharmace pharmaceutical companies are going to make a killing on this. And, mm -hmm. and, 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 the, and the investors are, are predicting with me, right, with the tripling of their stock price. Thank uh, you. I uh, love this very compelling argument. Um, I actually I'm curious about, and I know this might not be part of the food is medicine, medicine program, but uh, you know, I imagine that, it, that this would be even more valuable if, if physical activity is part of that behavioral change that you're trying for. And um, and I, it occurs to me that there may be like a real trade off here, where on the one hand, some for for some people, even a little bit of weight loss could like really make them more able to be physically active. And so that that could cause behavioral changes that could stick. But on the other hand, you talked about these side effects to the GLP ones, reducing motivation to go and do things. And, um, you know, I wonder about that piece, like, you know, is that is that going to be a challenge? And then also, uh, what does that mean for motivation to change diet? You know, can, you know, can you get people excited about eating lots of fruits and vegetables if they're kind of feeling like they're not motivated to do anything? Yeah. So, so first to go ba backwards from what in what you said, um, I didn't, I, I didn't intend to imply that that people were less motivated. It's more about the same sort of things that give them kind of a zest or make them funny or make them excited about things. You know, it, it doesn't mean people aren't motivated and working and able to meet their goals. It just means that people didn't seem to have that same you know, um, excitement about, about, about certain, certain things that they loved, loved before, um, uh, le less than pure, pure motivation to, to meet goals. I think people still, I don't think there's evidence for that. I, I very briefly mentioned, and it's in the commentary that a lifestyle program should be holistic and address physical activity, sleep, mental health, mental stress and, and diet. Um, that being said, there's very clear evidence that physical activity alone doesn't help with, with weight loss. Uh, and also that um, uh, that you know a lot of people can't maintain physical activity, right? Um, everybody eats, <laughs> and so and so you you have to eat, you have to eat, you don't have to exercise. So I do think physical activity is important. I do think it should be part part of a program, but I don't think it's necessary for for everybody, and and I don't think it's 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 as as important as as food. There's a, there's a there's been this sort of especially among physical activity people, sort of like 
both like they're equal they're not equal diet dominates you know um, risk diet dominates as a driver of the obesity epidemic uh, and so it is important sleep is important sleep is maybe even more important than physical activity because mm. again we all sleep um, on a population level but but it certainly should be part of a, a holistic behavioral lifestyle program and and there are some some companies thinking about this calibrate is a company that I advise who's thinking about this, not the food is medicine part, but they are thinking about this kind of holistic approach. Um, so if there's a Great. question in the room, there's exactly. We've got two in the room and maybe four online. So why don't I suggest we take all the questions and then you can answer because we only have I'll, 10 minutes I'll left. For, is that... I'll forget if we do all of them, but maybe we do okay. two at a time. All right, we'll take, let's take two in the room and then we'll do two and two online. Okay. Hi, my name is Sarah. I just wanted to thank you for coming in and speaking with us. Um, I'm going to keep my question general just because I have a thousand questions about the specifics of today. Um, but I'm just going to keep it general because based off my own interest as a pre-med. So we know, and you'd certainly emphasize like policy change drives individual changes. And I, but I still want to question and understand your opinion and how much effort we should put into, you know, cultural changes, whether that is through educative programs, um, for example, attention to the production of food. Uh, so I wanted to know how much effort we should put into that. And also how much does the Food is Medicine Institute consider how, how we produce food and access to land and stuff. Like that. Great, thank you. And one more in the back. Thank you so much, uh, Dari. My name is Danielle. I'm a postdoc here at Tufts. I'm wondering um, if there's been any discussion around GLP-1 use in children and if some of those mm. uh, cost and effectiveness uh, data that you showed were mainly within adults. Because, I mean, yeah, I'll keep it very broad as well. Yeah, so there has there has been a trial, and I, I don't know if it's been approved, but it's been submitted for approval. Um, there was a trial for GLP-1s in adolescents uh, that, that showed that it worked. And um, and um, I think it's been approved, and and so I think it's down to maybe ten or eleven. It was 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 tried in, and the American Academy of Pediatrics put out guidelines recently that were pretty controversial, but said if that if kids are obese and and se severely obese, they should be put on the drugs. They shouldn't mm -hmm. wait, you know, shouldn't delay anymore. Um, the the all of the other challenges stay the same. The cost, the tolerability, the long term cost effectiveness stays stays the same. Uh, and actually is even worse maybe because, you know, you have to get treat people for, for so many more years, but certainly they are, they are, this is coming, coming for your children um, for better or for worse. Um, and then I think that the first question, um, I, I absolutely feel that, that culture change is essential for, you know, shifting how we treat food and how people talk about food and, and how we think about food. That happens when we sort of reach a tipping point from other actions and other things. Um, you know, I don't know that education is, is um, you know, by itself, I don't think is going to do it. So I think we need to do other things. We published um, in 2022 a, a task force report on hunger, nutrition, and health that went through sort of a holistic suite of 30 national policies that we think together could make a difference. It includes policies on the production side, policies on the regulatory side, policies on the around SNAP and WIC and school meals. And so look up the task force report on hunger, nutrition, and health from, from Tufts. And it kind of goes through that, that suite of holistic, holistic issues. All right, uh, let's Larissa go to Larissa. And Jennifer. Right. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you so much. This is an incredible overview. And I really appreciate the combination of food as medicine um, as a way to sustain some of the potential potential health benefits and, and reductions in health disparities. Um, kind of along the lines of what Danielle brought up, I'm curious about um, you know, a lot of concerns being raised about potentially increases in prevalence and severity of disordered eating, particularly among mm -hmm. youth and young adults who might be seeing these um, drugs being used by celebrities and influencers. So just your thoughts on um, kind of what we can do as medical science or like health medical people um, to be anticipating that and to be you know, trying to avert some of those. Yeah, well, as you probably know better than me, you know, people who have disordered eating often um, have higher risk of ultimately obesity and diabetes and metabolic conditions, right? There is the, the other direction where people become extremely thin and anorexic, but there's many people with disordered eating go on to, to have uh, obesity and, and metabolic conditions. So um, I'm not an expert on, on, on you know, that, that spectrum of, of conditions. I do think we have to keep it in mind, as, as, as you mentioned. Uh, Jennifer? 
Hi, uh, thank you so much for this uh, presentation, uh, Dr. Mazafarian. I'm a actually a Friedman grad, uh, Nick Bick, class of 2019. And I'm also someone who takes these medications. Um, I've been taking Sexenda since July, 2022, mm. and I lost 20% of my body weight. Um, but what's important, I think, about that is that it's been uh, part of a treatment similar to what you're talking about. And I think part of this might come down to who's prescribing the medications. Uh, I go to a medical weight loss clinic, and so I have to see an RD, even though I have a master's degree in nutrition. I see an RD every three months, and we check in on nutrition, physical activity. Um, and because of shortages, I actually had two months where I had to go off the drug while, because it wasn't available. And I was able to at least maintain during that time. Uh, it was a short time, but, you know, it was scary. Um, so I think um, one thing I can definitely say that, you know, after losing that weight made it possible for me to be active, to be doing those things that um, I needed to do that I just, I couldn't otherwise, uh, I struggled without that uh, ability to lose that weight and, you know, get back to the life that I used to know. Yeah, well, th thank you for sharing your personal story openly. I think it's really, really important. And as I tr tried to highlight, you know, I'm not, this is not a presentation against GLP-1s. These are the most effective drugs we have, uh, you know, ever developed. And again, one the point of what I'm proposing is that that right now we're moving to rationing and to where people like yourselves can't get the drug, their insurance won't pay for it. And, and so rather than rationing, we need to have, I think, a, a more... Um, sensible approach. And what you're describing is also, um, as I think was mentioned in the chat, you know, the unusual, right? There's not a lot of, of programs that, that are doing that. And then the last point is, I don't know your own, you know, entire social and economic backgrounds, but as a Freedman School grad, um, I'm assuming that, you know, you ha don't face maybe some of the same structural barriers to healthy eating that low-income Americans or people of color or tribal communities, you know, may, may face. Um, and so that's why it, where imagine everything you've just described. Uh, and then on top of that, you know, you have uh, no income and unstable housing and, and inability to afford food. How wonderful would it be if in addition to everything that you got, you got a bag of groceries delivered to your house mm. once a week, um, you know, healthy food. And then, and then some, if you didn't know what to do with it, some culinary training. So I think your story in, in my mind highlights again, both that these are effective drugs that should be used. Um, and we can't use them and everybody who who's eligible for them for life because we'll go bankrupt. We'll literally go bankrupt as a nation. So, so, and, and not everybody can tolerate it either. So, so um, thank you for sharing, your, sharing your story. Um, there, there's a question online, which I'll just quickly answer um, about, um, uh, you know, what, what about the voices and, and, and the cravings? As I said, I, this has to be tested. This is a hypothesis. I think there'll be some patients who are able to go off the drug long-term there will be some patients who will have to have episodic boosters, and there are some patients who will just fail. Who will just fail within a few months, and so we'll have to figure that out and balance that. But I'm sure there'll be there'll be a large proportion of patients who, with a, effective lifestyle behavioral counseling and food as medicine, will be reasonably successful. Hey, B, B, I think you might be the, our last question. Go ahead. Oh my God! Well, I uh, thank you for a fantastic presentation and it made me want to run, uh, despite what we've heard, screaming from the room when you talked about the, the side effects and things. But you showed a slide early on that talked about, it, you showed the impact of these on different parts of the body and the brain, you talked about the cravings and the voices, but there were a lot of things that were on that slide about memory going up and cognitive this and that and that yet at the same time you're talking about these negative mood things and i don't know um if you have any comment on i can't i didn't take quick enough notes but there were uh, there were several things on that slide that suggested oh you could slow cognitive decline or you could improve and at the same time lose your zest for life, which doesn't sound like a good trade-off, but can you comment at all on that? 
Yeah, so certainly just from the weight loss and all of the metabolic improvements, we know this is good for brain health in terms of vascular health. And so GLP-1s in, in diabetic uh, patients with diabetes lowers risk of heart attacks and lowers risk of strokes. And mm -hmm. and and just from the metabolic benefits, we know that there was going to be benefits for, for brain health. Mm -hmm. um, I, I need to review the literature, B. I'm not an expert on, on GLP-1s in the brain. So you your question is inspiring me to review the literature to see independent of weight loss, you know, what are yeah. the benefits of GLP ones for brain health? I don't know. Certainly again, through weight loss, there, there are benefits and, and that, and that I don't want to people to leave remembering the, the zest for life comment, because that's something that's been anecdotal only that mm -hmm. I've been told by set, but, but I've been told by several people. So mm -hmm. I don't want to, I don't want that, but certainly lower sex drive has been documented. Um, mm -hmm. and that that's not nothing for, 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 for couples. Um, but, but I don't want that to be the, the main thing that people, people leave with, but I, 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 I will, I will read more about it, B and I'll, and I'll, you know, talk to you next time I see you and tell you what I've learned. I'd love that. Thank you. Great. Thank you. And so can I just say thank you with maybe some virtual and real applause. This was fantastic. Thank you for closing out our speaker series on such a hot topic. I can see that there are a lot of even unanswered questions and interest. So we look forward to following what, what comes of this. Uh, so please do keep us posted and thanks everyone for a great semester secret speaker series. Thanks. Nice to speak with everyone. Okay. Thank you.